Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier's Philippine Law Lectures for Students. For today's episode, we will be discussing the Data Privacy Act of the Philippines or for short, the DPA. Since this is a very broad subject, it would be better to devote entire episodes to a discussion of certain topics. Hence, today's discussion will only be a brief overview. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. By the way, for those interested in data privacy practice or those who want to learn more, one resource that may help you is a collection of case digests which I have made of cases decided by the National Privacy Commission or the NPC for cases decided between 2019 and 2022 which was current as of the time I made it in April 2023. This consists of around more or less 130 to 135 cases. And if you want a copy, I made it publicly available on Scribd. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, we can begin. Now, the common impression is that the DPA protects the right of privacy. While generally this is true, it is not entirely accurate because the DPA only protects a certain aspect of the right to privacy. Now, Olmsted versus the United States gives us the simplest and most popular definition of the right to privacy as being the right to be let alone. Hing versus Chowa Choi gives us a more specific description of this right as the right to be free from unwarranted exploitation of one's person or from intrusion into one's private activities in such a way to cause humiliation to a person's ordinary sensibilities. It is the right of an individual to be free from unwarranted publicity or to live without unwarranted interference by the public in matters in which the public is not necessarily concern. Thus, the right to privacy is broad and it has different aspects. Specifically, according to Vivares versus St. Teresa's College, the right to privacy has three aspects, namely locational or situational privacy, informational privacy, and decisional privacy. When we say locational or situational privacy, this refers to the ability of an individual to move in a public space with the expectation that under normal circumstances, their location will not be systematically and secretly recorded for later use. Informational privacy, on the other hand, refers to the right of individuals to control information about themselves. And decisional privacy involves the right to independence in making important decisions. Now, the Philippines has several laws that protect the right to privacy and its aspects. We have the Constitution, which protects the privacy of communication and correspondence, which is also protected under the Civil Code, which further protects personal privacy, including peace of mind and residence. Other similar laws on privacy include secrecy of bank deposits, the anti-wiretapping law, and others that may arguably be uh, laws on privacy. However, the topic for today, namely Republic Act or RA number 10173, otherwise known as the Data Privacy Act, was enacted specifically to protect one important aspect of privacy, namely the right to informational privacy, the second one I mentioned earlier, which again refers to the right of individuals to control information about themselves. Since the law specifically refers to individuals, the rights and protections under the DPA apply only to and may be invoked only by natural persons or actual people. So juridical persons like partnerships and corporations cannot claim protection for their personal information under the DPA. 
Thus, the DPA protects the informational privacy of individuals as evidenced by its declared policy, namely that the DPA seeks to protect the right of privacy of communication while ensuring free flow of information in order to promote innovation and growth. And how does the law do this? Well, the law defines the rights to personal information, it imposes obligations on those that control and process personal data, and by providing penalties for violation of those rights and obligations. So in other words, the DPA seeks to balance the processing of personal data with protection of the data subject rights. In essence, this law is a regulatory effort enacted pursuant to the police power of the state. Note that the intention of the law is regulation, meaning control or supervision and not prohibition. The Data Privacy Act does not prohibit processing of personal data. It does not say you cannot collect, store, use, or otherwise process personal information. Only that, if you want to process personal data, you have to comply with the obligations under the law, which include respecting and upholding the rights of data subjects. So specifically, the act which the DPA seeks to regulate is the processing of personal data. And what is this? Processing is defined as any operation or set of operations that is performed on personal information. So this encompasses the whole life cycle of data processing, including but not limited to collecting, recording, uh, organizing, storing, updating, modifying, retrieving, using, and even erasing or destroying the data. So as long as any of those are performed on personal information, then that will be considered as processing that is regulated by the DPA. However, not all processing of data is subject of regulation because the DPA only regulates processing of personal and sensitive personal information. Specifically, the DPA does not apply to the following kinds of information, namely, first, details on the position or function of any past or present government officer or employee, such as salary range, office address, telephone number, etc. Does not also apply to information on services that are performed under a government contract including the name of the contractor and the terms and conditions of the contract, among others. The DPA does not also apply to discretionary benefits of a financial nature, such as the granting of a license or a permit. The DPA does not also apply to, number four, information that is processed for uh, journalistic, artistic, or literary or research purposes. Neither will the DPA apply to information that is originally collected from residents of foreign jurisdictions that were collected in accordance with the laws of those foreign uh, jurisdictions even though it is processed in the Philippines. The DPA will also not apply to information that is needed to carry out the functions of public authority such as for banking or for law enforcement like policemen and other regulatory agencies. And finally, the DPA will also not apply to information needed by banks and financial institutions to comply with the Credit Information System Act or CISA or the Anti-Money Laundering Act or AMLA and other applicable laws. So, those kinds of information are not protected under the DPA. Again, the DPA only regulates but does not prohibit the processing of personal information. On the flip side, the law does not open itself up for abuse and it cannot be used to circumvent other laws or defeat established rights. Specifically, the Data Privacy Act cannot be used to compel disclosure of bank details as the DPA does not apply to and does not affect the operation of the Secrecy of Bank Deposits Law nor the Foreign Currency Deposit Act. 
While those laws may have exceptions of their own, the DPA is not one of them. And therefore, the DPA cannot be invoked to demand disclosure of bank details. Further, the DPA cannot also be used to prevent the filing of covered or suspicious transaction reports under AMLA or to otherwise defeat investigations related to money laundering because, as mentioned earlier, the DPA does not apply to information needed by banks and financial institutions to comply with AMLA and other applicable laws. Finally, the DPA cannot be used to compel publishers, editors, or duly accredited reporters of any newspaper, magazine, or periodical of general circulation to reveal the source of any news report or information that appears in said publication which was related to them in confidence. So again, the DPA does not prohibit but only regulates the processing of information. And even then, not all kinds of information. The only kind of information being processed that is subject of regulation by the DPA is personal and sensitive personal information. And what are these? Simply put, personal information is any information which can identify an individual. Meaning, the identity of the individual is either apparent, can be reasonably and directly ascertained by the entity holding the information, or when that information is put together with other information, it would directly and certainly identify that individual. So, as long as you can determine who is being referred to, whether immediately or in combination with other information, then that will be considered as personal information subject of regulation by the DPA. So, even if at first you cannot identify which Juan de la Cruz is being referred to, because that's a common name, but if you can pinpoint who that is, if you combine that, inf that name with other information such as age, gender, address, education, etc., then that name, even if common, will be considered personal information. Now, the law also regulates the processing of sensitive personal information and, in fact, imposes higher standards for the processing of this kind of information because this information can be used to discriminate against a person, such as information on an individual's race, ethnic origin, marital status, age, color, health, education, sexual life, or religious, philosophical, or political affiliation. Also, information about any proceeding for any offense committed or alleged to have been committed by such person, including the sentence of the penalty, if any. Okay, also, sensitive personal, uh, this falls under sensitive personal information. Third, information that is issued by government agencies peculiar to an individual, such as social security numbers, okay, or even tax returns, licenses, or even its denials, no? suspensions and revocations. Okay, these fall under sensitive personal information. And last, information will be considered as sensitive if it is specifically established by an executive order or an act of Congress to be kept classified. And it is important to distinguish whether information is personal or sensitive personal information because, as I mentioned earlier, the standards of protection are higher for sensitive personal information. And therefore, in case of violations involving sensitive personal information, the penalties are also higher. But who are these that are required to observe these standards of protection? Who are required to comply with the obligations imposed by the DPA? Following Section 4, the DPA applies to any natural or juridical person, meaning uh, actual people or even entities like partnerships or corporations, as long as they are involved in the processing of personal information, which I already defined earlier. And these uh, entities or uh, actual people fall under one of two categories, 
namely they are either personal information controllers or PICs for short or personal information processors or PIPs okay so a PIC is a person or organization who controls the collection holding processing or use of personal information but it does not include those who process personal information for personal family or household affairs so just because you collect and use a phone number of your friend this does not necessarily make you a PIC uh, if the purpose for which you collected that uh, information is just for your personal use okay it is when the purposes extend beyond such personal family or household affairs such as for processing for commercial use and other purposes that the DPA will now apply okay to regulate the processing of that information in order to protect the data subject rights so as mentioned PICs control that's why uh, they're called personal information controllers they control the processing of personal information and because of this control, the term PIC also covers those who instruct others to process personal information on their behalf. Of course, those who are just following the instructions of the PICs are not PICs, but rather they are PIPs. Okay? Specifically, a PIP or a personal information processor is any natural or juridical person to whom a PIC may outsource the processing of personal information. The PIC asks the PIP, hey, can you process this information for me? Okay? As mentioned, the PIPs perform processing only because they are following the instructions of their PIC under an outsourcing agreement. It is important to distinguish between PIC and PIP because the PIC is the one that is primarily accountable for complying with the DPA and for protecting the personal data that it processes whether by itself, through its employees, or by its agents, meaning the PIPs under those outsourcing agreements. So whether PIC or PIP, as long as they are engaged in the processing of personal or sensitive personal information, they are required to comply with the obligations imposed by the DPA. And the most significant obligations are the following. First, to adhere to the, the general data privacy principles. Second, to comply with the criteria for lawful processing. Third, to implement reasonable and appropriate organizational, physical, and technical measures to protect personal information. And fourth, to respect and uphold the data privacy rights of the data subjects. Now, of course, those are not all the obligations under the DPA. There are other important ones, such as registration and data breach notification and others. However, for lack of material time, I will only give a brief overview and instead discuss these obligations in a separate episode. Now, the first main obligation requires compliance with the general data privacy principles. And these principles serve as parameters, limits, or guides for those processing personal data. And these are necessary to establish trust between those that process the personal data and the data subjects. In general, the, da the general data privacy principles are transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality, TLP. Transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. And the DPA and its issuances expand upon these, which however, I will discuss in, in more detail in a separate episode. Now, briefly, the principle of transparency requires fairness and openness in processing. And to comply with this principle, the PIC or PIP must make the data subject aware 
of the nature, purpose, and extent of the processing, which includes the identity of those doing the processing, the risks and safeguards involved in the processing, and of course, the rights of the data subjects and how those rights may be exercised. The point is to make sure that the data subject is informed to the end that they will not be unfairly surprised on any aspect of the processing of their personal information. The second principle, namely that of legitimate purpose, also pertains to the second major obligation imposed by the DPA, namely that the PICs or PIPs must comply with the criteria for lawful processing. In other words, personal or sensitive personal information can only be processed if such processing is not prohibited by law and if there is a legitimate purpose to conduct such processing. The most common criteria to allow PICs or PIPs to process personal data is if the data subject gives their consent. Okay, that's very common. And you can see this often whether in person or through online consent forms wherein you give your consent to the processing of your personal data. However, consent is not the only basis for processing. And in some cases, consent may not even be necessary as long as another criteria exists to justify the processing of personal information such as in case of compliance with a legal obligation or to fulfill a contract. Now, a discussion of all the criteria for processing is best left to a separate episode because it's very, very long. But some of the legitimate purposes for processing personal information include, as I mentioned earlier, fulfillment or creation of a contract, compliance with a legal obligation, to protect the life and health of the data subject or if necessary to comply with uh, necessary to respond to a national emergency such as if you remember those health disclosure forms during the COVID-19 pandemic okay that's one example note that the criteria for processing that uh, personal information with which I just mentioned is different from the criteria to process sensitive personal information because as you remember standards are higher for the processing of sensitive personal information especially since this information can be used to discriminate against persons now i will discuss this more in detail in a separate episode okay as for the third principle we have the principle of proportionality which requires that personal data shall be processed only if the processing cannot reasonably done by other means in other words processing must be proportional to the purpose of the processing specifically PICs and PIPs must collect only relevant information meaning it should not collect data which is not needed for the purpose and this is the data minimization aspect of the principle of proportionality. Now, there's another aspect which is the storage limitation aspect which requires PICs and PIPs to store such information only for as long as necessary to fulfill the purposes for which that information was collected. Now, these principles of uh, transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality should not only be empty words, okay? Because the law requires PICs and PIPs to give life to these principles. How? By implementing reasonable and appropriate organizational, physical, and technical measures to ensure the protection of the personal data being processed. Now, what are these? Organizational measures refer to the creation and implementation of policies. Okay, these policies should govern data privacy best practices within an organization, including physical and technical security measures that must be complied with even by the lowliest employee all the way up to the topmost executive, so all members of the organization. And one of the most important organizational measure 
is the appointment of a data privacy or data protection officer or a DPO. Physical measures, on the other hand, refer to steps that must be taken to secure the processing of personal data, such as the design of the office space in order to monitor and limit access to the work area, schedule of activities, and other policies that can prevent unintended access or destruction of files or equipment, such as secure and fireproof file cabinets no so that the files won't get burned in the event of a fire or even measures to prevent others from seeing the personal data displayed on a computer screen so you can put up a barrier or something okay as i said these are physical measures and technical measures refer to security policies which can protect computer networks against accidental unlawful or unauthorized access or usage and uh, such as uh, encryption no and also programs to monitor security breaches and to restore access in case of physical or technical incidents among other similar measures thus the law requires PICs and PIPs to implement organizational physical and technical measures to give life to those general data uh, general data privacy principles that I mentioned earlier. Again, it's uh, transparency, legitimate purpose, and proportionality. Now, these general principles go hand in hand with the last obligation we will discuss today, namely that PICs and PIPs must respect and uphold the rights of data subjects. As you will discover, these general data privacy principles and the data subjects' rights complement each other. Okay. However, to give justice to this topic, it will be more appropriate to devote the whole episode to properly discuss all the rights of the data subject. Okay. Now, to make it easier to remember the rights of the data subject, think of these rights as flowing through each of the stages of the life cycle of processing. So, in general, the rights of the data subject are to be informed, to object, the right to access, the right to rectification or correction, to erasure and erasure or blocking, then to data portability, and the right to damages. Okay? So, at the start of the life cycle of processing and in line with the principle of transparency, data subjects have the right to be informed of whether personal data about them has been, is being, or will be processed. And this includes information about whether automated decision-making or profiling has been used. This right is most commonly fulfilled by the posting of a privacy notice which you may have seen posted on walls or when you enter a certain website, it pops up and you see that this is the privacy notice of that website. Now, since the data subject is aware that their personal data is being, has been, or will be processed, they also have, upon their demand, the right to reasonable access to, the, to information on the personal data being processed, such as what data was being processed, how and where it was obtained, the purpose and manner of processing, who will receive the data, and why are they receiving them, date of the last access and modification of the data, period of storage, and details of the DPO of the PIC or PIP. Of course, this right to access is limited only to the data subject's own information and they cannot access information of someone else. And this right to access can also be limited in certain cases such as where the information is publicly available anyway or in case of repeated requests or requests which require disproportionate eff effort to obtain or which may affect the health and safety of the data subject. Likewise, since the data subject is aware of the processing of their personal information, they also have the right to object to such processing, meaning they can say, no, stop, stop this processing. However, this right to object is only available if the basis for the processing is either consent or legitimate interest. 
In other words, if processing is based on another court criteria, such as to comply with a legal obligation or to fulfill a contract, then the data subject does not have the right to object. Now, if the data subject has the right to object to the processing, they also have the right to rectification or to dispute any uh, to dispute any inaccuracy or error in the personal data and have it corrected within a reasonable time. Of course, not all requests for rectification will be granted, such as in case the correction requires an order from a court or other official process, such as in cases of a substantial change in name. Now, certainly, if the data subject can object and demand correction, they also can demand the right to erasure or withdrawal, blocking, removal, or destruction of their personal data from the filing system of the PIC under certain grounds, of course, such as if the data is incomplete, used for unauthorized purposes, or no longer necessary for the purposes for which it was collected. The PIC may also refuse the demand for erasure in certain instances, such as if the information is still necessary to complete the purpose for which it was collected or for other legitimate business purposes, among others. Now, again, these are, uh, said there, these are a lot and I will just discuss this in a separate episode. Now, one more right of the data subject is in case the data is processed by electronic means and in a structured and commonly used format. Take note. Okay, the data subject in this case has the right to data portability, meaning that the data subject can obtain a copy of that personal data in the same format. So examples of this format no, would be a PDF, .xml, or .json, no? uh, stuff like that. Okay? Note that, as I just mentioned, this right of portability is only available if the processing was by electronic means and in a structured and commonly used format. Additionally, this right is only available if the processing was based on consent or contract only. Okay? Thus, if the basis for processing is something other than consent or contract, and especially if processing was not by electronic means or in a structured and commonly used format, such as when the processing was done through pen and paper, then this right to portability is not available. Finally, we have the right to damages, which uh, by which a data subject can be indemnified for, damage, for the damage they may have suffered in case of violation of any of their data subject rights, which I just mentioned. The data subject may also claim damages in case of inaccurate, incomplete, outdated, false, unlawfully obtained or unauthorized use of their personal data. And to exercise this right to damages, the data subject may simply file a complaint before the appropriate tribunal. Okay? Note that these rights of the data subject are transmissible to the lawful heirs and assigns of the data subject in case the data subject dies, is incapacitated, or is otherwise incapable of exercising those rights, meaning the heirs or the assigns of the data subject can exercise any of those rights to be informed, to object, to rectify, etc. if the data subject cannot do it for themselves because they are already dead, incapacitated, or are otherwise incapable. So, those are the main obligations under the DPA. To review, PICs and PIPs must adhere to the general data privacy principles, comply with the criteria for lawful processing, implement reasonable and appropriate organizational, physical, and technical measures to protect personal information, and respect and uphold the rights of data subjects. And of course, failure to comply with the obligations under the DPA or otherwise violating its provisions are punished with the corresponding penalties. Some punishable acts include unauthorized processing, access due to negligence, processing for unauthorized purposes, malicious or unauthorized disclosures, 
intentional data breaches, and concealment of security breaches, among others. Now, to facilitate compliance with the DPA, the NPC or the National Privacy Commission developed what is known as the Five Pillars of Compliance, which encompass the basic obligations of PICs and PIPs. These are, one, the designation, the designation of a DPO, two, the conduct of a Privacy Impact Assessment or PIA, three, maintenance of a PMP or Privacy Management Program, four, implementation of data privacy and data security measures, and five, management of personal data breaches. And these five pillars of compliance expand into a 32-point uh, compliance checklist for which we are unfortunately out of time and I will uh, I may discuss this in a separate episode okay so that's it for an overview of the data privacy act of the Philippines and I hope you may have learned a thing or two I hope to see you next time guys see you soon bye